Welcome to TheaterCast, presented by the EdReach Network, giving educators a voice, a big voice. You've reached episode number 66, being recorded November 2nd, 2014. This is the show where theater teachers and professionals share their passion for theater trends, share practical advice and tips, and ask questions of some of theater's most innovative collaborators. I'm one of your co-host, Nick Cusimano, and joining me, as always, <laughs> and if the internet gods are with us, Danielle Pilots. <laughs> Good even tide, ladies and gents. And then we this week joining us is Whitney Christensen, and um, we were able to contact, we get hooked up with uh, Whitney through our uh, my good friend, and I think Danielle's too, at least virtually, uh, Donnie Piercy uh, from Kentucky, bringing Google Apps to all of Kentucky, and one day we will break the Microsoft trust there <laughs> uh, all because of Donnie's persistence um, is Whitney Christensen and she is a theater teacher and does a lot of work uh, with the Kentucky Renaissance Fair and so I'm gonna let you say hey <laughs> to the listeners <laughs> Hello, listeners. Um, I am a teacher, English and drama teacher, and I uh, teach a youth guild at the Kentucky Renaissance Fair, so I, I wear a lot of hats. Literally. Yes, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Some of them are pointy. Yeah. <laughs> Probably has, you know, 10 or 12 of them easily. <laughs> Some of them are pirate hats, even. <laughs> um, can you kind of tell us how you got into uh, Renaissance Fair and... Uh... What the, what it kind of, how, how the bug bit you? Well, um, I started going in college, uh, which was more years ago than I'd like to admit. Um, <laughs> and uh, I started going just in, you know, jeans and a t-shirt. And then after a few years, I was like, oh, look at the cool dresses. And, and um, being a bit of a costumer, I kind of got into that. And I always liked the costume part of theater. And then uh, one day I just showed up at the Kentucky Renaissance Fair, and I made friends with a couple of people there. And... Um, a couple of guys ended up actually pulling me up on stage to sing a song when they heard I can sing. So it's my first day at Kentucky Renaissance Fair, and they're pulling me up on stage. And then uh, at the end of the day, they both looked at me and were like, so you're joining cast next year, right? And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I auditioned in March the next year and ended up um, playing a noble lady on cast for a few years. And then um, two years ago, the boss of the Renaissance Fair... Uh, called me up and asked me, and he said, hey, we want to get some local talent involved and some of the teenagers and the youth involved. How do you feel about starting a teen guild? And, and I said, okay. And that's how I ended up doing the Minions, which is what I call them. So <laughs> I, I love the name. Of that, so. <laughs> they actually came up with the name themselves, which I love because it means I get to tell everybody that I have Minions. So. <laughs> and was that before or after Despicable Me? That was, it was actually after the first movie, um, and we didn't really make the connection, but the sequel came out the first year we were doing it, um, so I made them tiny little foam badges of little yellow minions to wear around, and then we, we went to the second movie as our cast party, so. Oh, what fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, um, such great fun, and I think, um, the Renaissance Fair offers, um, a lot of improv and thinking on your feet opportunities. Um, can you kind of give our listeners an idea of what what a typical day at a Renaissance Fair is like? Um, yes, and you're not wrong about, about the improv. That is most of what <laughs> we do. Um, the kids all have to, and, and the adult cast as well, we all create our own characters, and we try to populate this fictional village of Briarwood, which is set in 1320, which is in Scotland in the reign of Robert the Bruce. So we're, we're actually a Middle Ages fair rather than a Renaissance fair, but we keep the name because more people come if it's a Renaissance <laughs> fair. They don't get the, the Middle Ages bug. Um, but we have an opening gate where um, pretty much all the acts and all the actors uh, greet the uh, patrons as they come in the gate, and we usually sing a little bit, and there's some dancing. And, and, um, and then as the day goes on, there's some scheduled events. Uh, my kids personally cheerlead for all of the jousts, which, um, in talking about improv, means that they have fun insulting each other a lot. 
Um, you know, they, they, the girls get in fights over who's the prettiest knight, and the boys have to drag them off, so we do a little bit of stage combat. Um, they, they yell things at the knights like, my grandmother falls off a horse better than that! And, and, um, and then we have, you know, we have a couple of pub sings throughout the day, so there's some music involved, and, um, and then we have a big closing pub sing at the end where everybody gets together and um, sings. And then uh, we do have our scripted shows as well. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into about the scripted I'm show. Sure. We have a couple of those. Um, well, the kids actually wrote two scripted shows um, that they put on, which are a mix of the Middle Ages and modern. Um, two years ago, uh, I wrote the framework for one called Myth Conceptions, which... Um, takes a lot of the Middle Ages myths like peasants never bathed and uh, um, the, everybody died of the plague or everybody died when they were 20, uh, things like that, and we, we, we take it a, and we make it dating game style. So there's a little bit of improv where we end up pulling somebody out of the audience and putting them up on stage and, and rescuing them, and they have to get rescued by either a knight um, or our monk or our peasant. And, and, and of course, they get to ask the guys questions and, you know, oh, well, how are you going to rescue me from this tower? And, you know, our blacksmith says something silly like, I'm going to forge you an iron ladder, but it's going to take me ten years, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's always fun to see because we always pull, we're pulling up a damsel, but we always try to pull up the biggest, burliest guy in the crowd. So <laughs> who then has to be the damsel to get rescued. Um, and that was actually, I wrote the framework, but my drama class from that year wrote all the jokes and created all the characters. So I just filled in and I said, well, okay, well, here's how it's going to go. And they're way funnier than I am, by far. And, and know way more jokes that people in the audience are going to get. Um, so they wrote, wrote that. And it, it, it's probably our biggest hit. This year we did um, a modern day version of Everyman, which is a medieval morality play. And uh, it's picking up steam as people are starting to come see it as well. Um, but it's got modern day versions of all the riches. Is uh, a girl comes on stage and she's got her Miss Me jeans on and she's got her cell phone and her iPad and her iPod and her music going and she's too busy listening to her music to, to pay attention to what's going on. And uh, we have Kindred and Cousin, which are the family members. And I made them wear a giant T-shirt that said "I'm with Stupid" and then they wore it at the same time, so they were Siamese twins. Um, <laughs> So, and, and uh, that one was actually, again, I wrote the framework, and then one of my students who is, um, she's a governor scholar here, uh, wrote the rest of the, the script and the jokes and came up with the characters, and that, one's, that one is gaining some steam. It took a little while for us to figure out the kinks of what was funny and what wasn't if you don't know the show already. So, But they do those a couple of times a day in, uh, in the forest with no technology, which is always fun. <laughs> so. so, Yeah. Well, I think it's um, great that you are able to work with that framework because I think it it really teaches them to be uh, on your feet problem solvers because you can't uh, you know oh, no lights to program <laughs> right <laughs> we can't use some of the tricks that we like to use <laughs> no and there there is no fade to black and in fact actually it started raining one day in the middle of the show. Like, they'd started the show, and it was sunny, and then it starts pouring down rain, and we're in the middle of the forest, and my kids are so great. Um, they actually ushered the entire audience under the trees and put the show on under the trees and used a, a big chalkboard for a setting, and they drew the setting on the chalkboard instead, and they, they just went with it, and it was great. <laughs> so. Well, it's great you can give them that sense of there be the whole improv idea of there being no mistakes and that uh, you treat everything like it's fuel for the show as opposed to an obstacle. Yes. Well, they have to learn that really quick. And they get, when I first get them and I get the new ones, they're very stuck on the script. And they're like, well, that's not how the line goes. And I'm like, <laughs> It's never going to go that way, and we actually build in parts to improv in the script. And, um, and they have some really good models, too. There's some really good acts at the, the Renaissance Fair that I actually, I'll, if I haven't seen them, I'll YouTube them, and I'll say, this is what we're going for, that kind of relationship with an audience where it's give and take. So it doesn't get stale. It's never the same show twice. Because it's never the same audience twice, and it's never the same weather twice. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
And I bet there's a real art to, you talked about pulling people up on stage, you getting pulled up on stage. There's an art, just, I, I can compare this, I think, to um, working a haunted house is mm -hmm. the same vibe, just different costume, different hats. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's an art to knowing who to pick out in the audience, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, the people that won't make eye contact with you, you leave them alone. They don't want to play. Um, and, and you know, you don't always get it right. Sometimes you, somebody looks like they're willing to play, and then you ask them, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> but there, you're right. There is that art to noticing who's making eye contact, who's smiling, um, who's laughing throughout the show, you know, who, who kind of sits up a little straighter when they start looking through the audience. I mean, there's a, a lot of body language that goes into it. Um, can you uh, t tell us about the writing process? Because I think you've touched on a really interesting thing on, I think that's something we can provide as teachers is that framework, you know, we have, we have the road map, but letting them drive the car. <laughs> right, sense. right. Um, can you uh, give us, kind of talk us through how the process went with um, working with them on, uh, creating those uh, two shows. I think it's really interesting that also you've touched on Every Man, which I think is such a universal show. <laughs> Even yes. Every Man, yes. <laughs> Very astute um, observation, yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's interesting on how some of those themes are, you know, 800, you know, seven, 800 years old, and we're still, still dealing with them. Yes. Um, well, it was two really different processes. Uh, the first one with Myth Conceptions, um, I was teaching, it was my first year teaching high school drama, and we were, we were in the spring of that year, and I knew that this Renaissance Fair, this, this was the first time I had done uh, The Minions, and I knew I wanted to do this stage show. Um, but I, and, and I had kind of started developing the script, but I had this really, really talented group in this drama class. Um, it, it was just one of those blessing kind of things where you just have the right group of kids. And uh, we were studying every man before Christmas, and they loved it. And they really liked the Middle Ages, so we, pro we ended up spending a little more time on it than we probably should have with the schedule I had for that year. But it, after Christmas, I realized I was going to be doing this thing at the Renaissance Fair. And... Um, some of the things that they talked about when every man came along, you know, things that they had total wrong ideas about the Middle Ages, and, and there'd been a lot of running jokes about, you know, never bathing and things like that. And I thought about it, I thought, what if I give this to them? So I actually had a competition, and I said, anybody whose jokes and anybody whose script is good enough will go in the final show. But if it, I'm not putting it in there unless it's good enough. But if it goes in there, you can come. It'll be a professionally produced show. You can come see your work. And then I split them up, and I had every student or, or in pairs, sometimes they worked, picked a medieval idea. Some, like I said, the never bathing, um, the idea of everybody dying at a young age. So they picked a specific myth, that they, a misconception that they held, and they did some research, and they had to write one page of a script and make it funny. And uh, in the end, I had about 20 parts, and um, of those 20, I had about eight that really, really worked well. And um, a couple of them I, I saw worked well together. For example, one of the ones we had, it was I had two students who knew what our stage looked like, and it stands about six to eight inches off the ground. I'm trying to get this in the video. <laughs> about that far off the ground. Um, and one of my students knew that, and she worked it into her script. So our knight, when he comes in to rescue the damsel, is afraid of heights and, <laughs> and won't take that one step up. And he's terrified, you know, and he's, uh, he finally gets up there, and he's scared to death. And, and the whole joke is that he's been having to go to the bathroom the whole time. And he finally gets up there, and he squeals, and the, the damsel says, okay, okay, you can go to the bathroom now. And he says, oh, I don't have to anymore. <laughs> and of course, you know, everybody loves bathroom humor. Yep. Um, so that one made it in. And it was it was just a process of those if you were if you were funny enough and you had an understanding for how the space worked, it, it went in. I had a few that were like, Oh, let's have fireworks and special effects and I was like, guys, it's a plywood stage. <laughs> <laughs> um so that's how Myth Conceptions came together and it, it just and then I, I spent about 
two weeks of my entire life just paring it down and paring it down and paring it down. And we worked on it every weekend um, for two months and threw out what didn't work and capitalized and, and added on to what did. And, and, and I can go on and on about every man if you want. I don't know. I feel like I've been talking for a while. <laughs> no, I, I find it very interesting and... Um... I really like your process because you pulled in competition, which you put that competition. They love that. They <laughs> love that. You have the public part that this is going to be performed in the audience, and if you if you raise the stage, right. it kicks them up in gear that much more. Right. Um, it's they don't care if they have to put it on for their classmates, but a real audience, oh. Yeah, and they, then they get nervous. It also drives me crazy as the director because of like. I want to see the good show, too. Right, right. <laughs> I don't like him. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's, you know, my issue to work through through my, <laughs> on my own. <laughs> um, no, I'd love, we'd love to hear about every man because I think that has such, such uh, heart and just a totally different um, take, too, than... Um. Sure. Every Man is one of my favorite plays. Um, I read it in college and, and liked it, but I didn't really get it until I started teaching it. And um, it's it, it always is my students' favorite play of the whole year. And they just latch onto it, which is interesting because they're young and they don't really... they don't really have that fear of dying, I don't think, that you start to get as you get older. Um, but one of my assignments every year, and actually uh, my drama class right now is working on it, is I make them develop their own allegory for every man. Uh, so they have to come up with a modern version, or they set it in a historical period. It has to be recognizably different. Uh, last year, the most memorable one I had is I had a group of kids who every trait in every man um, became a musical style. So death was heavy metal, and um, kindred and cousin were country music, and <laughs> and so and they all came in, and it was and it was great, and it was so funny. And um, after that happened, I, I started thinking, you know, I I really I want the public to know about this. Every drama major, every person who's ever done theater knows every man, but the majority <sighs> of the populace doesn't, and it's just it's one of those plays I feel like everybody should know, and. I really wanted to get some of the language of every man in there, the, the, the original script, but I didn't want to overwhelm my audience with it. So I started out, again, writing a framework, and, and I was working on um, a Middle Ages class for my master's program. And I started writing it as a project for that, but ended up, it didn't work for the project, so I kind of, it kind of sat there for a month with just the beginning and the end. And I was like, ah, and I was so swamped with uh, my master's, and I was telling one of my students about it, who's a very accomplished playwright. She's um, been a runner-up and a competitor in our Actors Theater of Louisville Young Playwrights competition here, and she just submitted her third play for it this weekend, and I'm like, this is the year she's going to win, I, I just, I really think. So I was talking to her about it, and she's like, well, let me take a look at it. I was like, okay, you know, here, just see, see what you think. She looks at it over the weekend, and she comes back to me with two-thirds of a completed script. <laughs> and it's like, here, tell me what you think. <laughs> okay. And it was great, and uh, we tweaked it here and there. I took it to the, the Minions when we started rehearsals for that, and I tweaked it here and there. She ended up trying out for the Minions and getting into it, because um, she wasn't the year before. And then we took that one, and we actually when we still had scripts in hand, we took it in front of the adult cast, the veterans of the fair, and we put it on, scripts in hand. And then we asked them, what do you see? What needs to change? What, what's funny? What's not funny? What do we need to add? What do we need to take out? And we developed it from there. So it was a very different process, but both of them ended up being great shows. And so when you work with your kids and they're working with the Run Fest, um, Run Fair, is that part of your regular coursework or is that extracurricular for them? Um, it is actually, I would say totally separated from school, but then this year we blurred the lines a little bit. It's a very, it's a very strange mishmash. Um, because I have, I, I teach high school, 
And many of my kids, because of their interactions with me, feel comfortable with the Renaissance Fair and love theater, and they join it because they know me and I'm easy. I'm an easy entry into it. Um, but it's also open to kids from anywhere, as long as they can make it to rehearsals. We do have an audition process in March, um, so you do have to be able to project, and you do have to be able to do some improv and the basic uh, theater stuff. Um, I do teach them a lot about improv. but um, So the majority of my kids come from the high school where I teach, uh, but I do have some from outside, and that's growing. I get a few more from the outside every year, which means auditions get a little more interesting because I have to tell more kids no. Um, and then this year, we this Christmas, we're doing a Dickens event, and for the first time ever, um, the boss called me up again and said, hey, this teenager thing is working really well. Why don't you get them involved in the Dickens thing? And I went, okay. <laughs> so, But I'm also, I'm on stage during that because we do scenes for the Dickens, and I'm like, well, what am I going to do you know, how am I going to supervise them and help them out when I'm actually in the scene? And so I roped in our choir teacher at the school, and I was like, hey, why don't you help me out? So now that is actually limited to just kids from the high school because she's holding um, choir rehearsals at the school. So I had to kind of blur the lines a little bit. So, um, so it's totally extracurricular for the most part in the summer, in the spring and summer. It's not connected with the school at all. Um, though sometimes when it rains, I cheat and have rehearsals in my classroom because it's rainy and soggy. Um, but then in the winter, it looks like it's going to be more connected to the school. Um. That's great that both your school is supportive of that and that the folks who run the fair are supportive of you as a teacher. It's a smart connection for both sides. Well, it ended up working out in, in even more than you think. The guy, the, the boss of the fair, my manager, Ed, his granddaughter is in my English class. Um, so they, there was a little bit of fraternizing there already. Um, but when he moved his family to come to Eminence because he wanted his grandkids in the school. It is a really, and I'm, and I'm very lucky. You said I'm lucky. My administrators are super supportive. Um, they come out to see the kids at the fair. They know what's going on. They ask me. They ask the kids about it. They're really, really great with it. Yeah, I've heard a lot of great things through Donnie about Eminence, and um, it sounds like a great place to work, which um, is always something that makes uh, doing what we do that much uh, easier and fun. Um, so, and the Dickens is, uh, which I, I went to the Kentucky um, Renaissance Fair website and saw a little bit about that, um, and it's great because people love to go see shows at Christmas yeah. time. Um, I don't like doing shows at Christmas time, but that's just me. Imagine being outside at Christmas time, too. <laughs> that's just, I'm just usually like, I'm done by then, I'm just like. <laughs> but um, I appreciate anyone who uh, is able because it, it means so much to those people who see those shows because it, to that to them it's Christmas if that makes sense. Um, yes. So can can you tell us a little bit about the the Dickens um, the Dickens. Yeah. Project, um, it's, it, well, it, I, it's understandable <laughs> that you don't know what to call it. It is such a mishmash of things, and it's it's one of my favorite shows um, that I've ever done because all those things you want to be doing at Christmas um, happen during Dickens, and um, it's a it started out as a as a smaller event. Um, but last year we had some crazy inclement weather and we still had people braving ice and snow and things like that to get in the gate, which I thought was crazy. I'm like, there's like six inches of snow out there, like and, and ice, what are you doing? Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a very different event. What we do is it's a six hour long day and on the half hour, on the hour and half hour, so every 30 minutes, we put on a scene from A Christmas Carol. And we place those scenes at different places around the fair site. So Scrooge's office is going to be on Main Street where all the, the booths are and the shops are. And then um, we actually have a, a great big Celtic cross, which we then decorate as the grave site, and that becomes the cemetery for the end. And then in the pub, we have the any scenes that we need dark or, or Scrooge's house or things like that. So, so people actually have to travel around the site in order to see the different scenes. 
Um, and in so doing, they get to go shopping for Christmas stuff. There's hot chocolate, you know, things like hot buttered rum, which, you know, of course we're not feeding the kids, but... Um, and then we have this great big huge Christmas dinner at the end, which we actually, as actors, actually eat on stage. And it's a real, it's our, really our dinner, and that's the closing scene is the big party where Scrooge comes in, which if you've never had to eat in a scene in front of a crowd, uh, your entire dinner, and people are taking pictures, and you're like, <laughs> you get your mouth open for the pictures. <laughs> it's an experience. Um, so that's uh, it is a lot of it is outdoors though, so we do have to worry about inclement weather. And uh, there's a lot of music too because we open every scene with a Christmas carol, and some of them are you know happy jolly ones, and then others are very very creepy like Coventry Carol. So all the music sets the mood, and then the kids this year are coming in and caroling in between the scenes and populating the village and and all that. So it's a very different feel from um, the Renaissance Fair the rest of the year, but it's, it is one of my favorite things. Yeah, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. We have a thing in uh, St. Charles um, in Missouri. Uh, it's called Christmas Traditions, which not not as tied to Dickens. Well, there's there's a ton of Dick characters from Dickens, but right. all the different Santas, and they, they go along Main Street, and it's all improv, and they interact, and they do a story. So that's one of our Christmas traditions. Like yeah. after Thanksgiving, we go down there, and sometimes the weather's chilly, and sometimes it's balmy because that's same. Right, <laughs> right. We did have the coolest, one of the coolest moments that's ever happened to me in theater. Uh, the very first year we did Dickens um, during the graveyard scene, it just started to patter a little bit of rain, and somehow about 20 people in the audience all had black or navy blue umbrellas, and they all opened them up. And suddenly, it looked like a funeral, and it was, wow. it was the, the audience. It was great, and it's never happened since. But it was wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's neat to have all those um, just fun theater moments that you get to interact with, and uh, stuff you can't plan. No, I think that's great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about? Your your day, <laughs> what your day's like as a theater teacher outside of doing the Renaissance Fair? Just um, well, I teach both English and theater. Though I, in teaching English, I always manage to work some Shakespeare in there and some plays. Um, but um, as a as, as a drama teacher, um, it's very interesting to see. I've had three totally different years of kids. Um, I had one huge group that started out about half full of really enthusiastic kids and about half full of uh, football players who sat in the back row like, oh, I want to be here for this. Why do I have to take drama? Um, and by the end of the year, most of the kids, I mean, I think I only had one or two that were still like, what is this theater thing? Uh, most of them were really super involved, and, and, and we would we studied. We even all got to study Afro Ben's The Rover, though I, of course, edited that. I don't know if you know The Rover, but it's it's a restoration play, and so there's a fair amount of banter in there that I had to cut out, but there's a lot that it says about relationships between men and women, and so we discussed that, and of course that really got all of them in. And then last year, I had a tough bunch that of kids that I really love, but just theater was just not their thing, and the way the schedule worked out, um, you know, it, it, they, they only really had two electives to choose from, and it was either me or art. <laughs> And so they kind of came into my class. So that was a different bunch because I had to really think about, okay, well, what is going to get to this group? And I totally ended up changing most of my curriculum for that year. So um, I did a lot more improv games with them because that was what was going to interest them. Um, I didn't do as many heavy, long scripts. We didn't read as much Shakespeare, but instead um, I let them do projects where they researched individual plays. Um, and then we did some with Commedia dell'arte because they really liked uh, that physical comedy. And we even watched a little bit of Tom and Jerry to kind of tie it in. But like, this is what physical comedy is. And so they researched the masks and, um, and, and they liked that because they could relate to that. They were like, oh, this is, you know, dumb stuff like we do, like fart jokes and things like that. I was like, yes, that is. <laughs> Um, and then this year, I have because we ended up expanding our electives to the kids have about 10 or 15 to choose from. Um, I ended up with a really small group of about um, nine kids, and they're all super enthusiastic theater kids. Um, and so we, on one hand, we're getting through plays really, really fast, but on another hand, 
they're having so much fun improving and making up lines as they go that half the time I, I give them the script and I'll sit at my computer and I'll make notes. And so now we're reading Every Man and they'll be joking around about the characters and I'm like, I am totally adding this into the script for next year. <laughs> so, you know, and I tell them that. I'm like, you know, come up with something good. You give it to me. You never know. You, you might make a cameo. We'll see. So I have to kind of adapt my process depending on which the group of kids is. So That's so cool. So uh, tell, back to the Ren Faire and maybe for Dickens too. I don't know if you use kids in that show, but uh, you said you will be. Um, what is the audition process like if, if there happens to be a kiddo listening right now who's thinking, I want to do that? What do they expect and what are you looking for? Um. Well, the audition process um, is threefold, um, and some of that is because when, when the kids audition for the fair, they audition for all the casts and guilds at the same time, and then we have a checkbox where you put your top three choices. Um, now, if it's a teenager that, that says they want to be in the Minions, I get first crack at them, so I get to say whether I want them or not. Um, and I do have an age limit. I'm the only guild in the fair that has an age minimum and maximum. They so have to fall in that category first. Um, and then at that point, they have to do three things. They have to, um, for me, they have to come in and give a one to two minute monologue. And I do tell them I prefer comedy because they're going to be trying to entertain people. I'm like, I don't, don't, don't give me a death scene, you know, because I, I want to see can you be funny and you got comedic timing. Um, then they also have to improv. And um, they, what I'm looking for in the improv is can they open the scene? Um, do they wait for the other person to start something and then play off that? Or do they have the capability to come up with a funny situation all on their own and carry it themselves? Um, and then they have to sing. I, as the Minions don't actually have a musical um, requirement, but we are, we, I allow them and I actually take part as well in our musical component. We have a pub sing that our um, Briarwood players, which is the street cast, they do, and so they allow us to join in with them. So we, they have to sing a little bit, but if they're, if they can't sing or they don't want to sing, it's I, I'm like just croak out something and it'll be fine. <laughs> so, um, so there's threefold process for that, um, and I'm looking for kids with energy. I'm looking for kids who can be social, who can talk to other people, um, make other people feel comfortable in their presence. Because um, that's the majority of what they need to do, is they need the people who are coming in the gate, paying us money, they want to make the patrons feel like part of the action. Um, for Dickens, they actually have to be able to sing, because their major uh, responsibility is to sing Christmas carols. So they do have to be able to sing for that. Um, but there's not as much responsibility as far as knowing how to act. So it's a different, different situation. That that definitely shows a, a lot of um, it's bringing out those skills that I think students need that will serve them the rest of their lives. Um, because yes. if they're able to make people feel comfortable and interact with them and um, make those type of connections on their feet, that is a skill that, um, and I don't think they realize that I think they do it because they think it's fun, and later on, all of a sudden, they'll <laughs> realize. Right. About 30, and, oh, 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 well, I like that. <laughs> that came in handy, <laughs> actually. That came in handy. But it's, you know, it's one of those things as teachers, okay, plant the seed. And, right. <laughs> and see how it grows. Go <laughs> forth. <laughs> Go forth and improv. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, do you have any favorite memories over the years that, that stick in your head? That. Um... Oh, I have to say, um, one of my favorite things that's ever happened at the Renaissance Fair this year. Um. During every man, um, death, <laughs> the word is poofs up um, goods to meet every man. And, and uh, every man is like, can't you just poof her up or something? And death is like, no, I can't poof her up. And, and every man says, well, you know, humor me or something like that. And death goes, poof. And goods walks onto <laughs> the stage. And Goods looks around and says, well, this isn't Qdoba, you know, which is. <laughs> so, um, 
And then they talk for a little while, and finally Goods looks at Death and says, can you poof me up a burrito? And, of course, Death says, no. Well, the very last day of the fair, and I may or may not have known about this ahead of time. I will neither confirm nor deny. Um, but one of my kids, um, who was not on stage during that scene, brought a burrito. And so when, when Death says, no, I cannot poof you up a burrito, he tossed the burrito from the back of the stage, and it splats in the middle of the stage, and none of the kids on stage knew it was coming. <laughs> so everybody stops dead and just stares at this burrito. <laughs> so that is the kind of shenanigans that I um, encourage, because I want them to have to think about stuff as, they're, as it's happening. So. And audiences love that when they go see a show and they feel like, oh, I think they just made that up on the spot. I don't think that they love that. That's what they go home talking about more yeah. than even a funny line. And, and when you can see the look on the kids' faces and you know that was not planned, you know that they didn't know it was going to happen and they go on with it anyway. I mean, that's, that's, that's my favorite part of what I do. Peter Gold. <laughs> Um, I remember uh, we were working on Midsummer uh, this past couple of weeks and was talking about in rehearsal and they were finally getting to that point. I'm like, yeah, rehearsal's not about knowing your lines. It's about finding the fun. Right. I really like that description. <laughs> There's a reason they call it a play. Right. <laughs> well, and I, and, and this is... Uh... This is a lot of work. I try. I don't always succeed, but I try to get them to understand that to learn your lines as fast as you can so that we don't spend rehearsal time with a script in hand. And you can, if you, you should know it well enough, you can't get it wrong. And that way you have the freedom to have fun with it. So you're right. Rehearsal should not be about learning your lines. It should be about learning where the points are you can change your lines are. <laughs> I think and I think uh, I'm. You are able to have so much fun with your students, and uh, that's something to be admired. And uh, I can already tell that. I mean, just through our conversations, how much fun uh, they're able to have. <laughs> we have um, a great. The, we have a blast. <laughs> and for, and you do a nice job of of giving them freedom and also responsibility at the same time. Uh, I'm. I think that a lot of teachers might not feel uh, comfortable giving them the ability to write the script or to, to look at their own script. And I think it's so important and great that you do that. And uh, I mean, when I first started teaching years ago, uh, <laughs> my boss said, uh, the kids will do exactly what you expect of them. And it sounds like you expect a lot and therefore you get a lot. I, I do expect a lot because I you know I tell them this is a professional show these people paid money to see you guys you know give them give them what they paid for and but and you talked about it not being comfortable it's not comfortable it's never come and I bite my nails you know a lot when I'm like oh how is this gonna go and there have been moments where I'm like I don't know whether to be proud or ashamed I don't know <laughs> um, but you're right they do if you expect them to rise to that level and you expect them to perform at that level most of them will do it. And the ones who wouldn't, wouldn't have anyway. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so think about, the, think about those kids that will. Yeah. Yeah. When will you find out about your student with the uh, Actors Theater of Louisville? Well, um, I don't know. It's, huh. I feel like last year I heard right after Christmas break, maybe first couple weeks of January, so it takes a little while. Uh -huh. And then um, if she gets in, the Actors Theater actually does a full professional production mm -hmm. of her play with, uh, you know, sets and costume and scenery, and they'll, they'll put it on. And, and, you know, the last two plays she wrote for it, she was a runner-up one year, and then she didn't make it in last year. And, and um, I read her script and helped her with it this year, and, and I can't see a world where nobody puts this play on. It's so good. You know, I, I couldn't have written this play this year, much less when I was 18 years old in high school. Um, and it's themes about, you know, somebody's relationship with food and, and, and how that connects to their hidden desires. I mean, it's, it's genius. It's brilliant. So I'm, I'm really crossing my fingers. <laughs> you will, too. <laughs> yeah, I think. 
it's always great when they're able to cr be able to do that creation mode um, at that age. I yeah. had, had one who we had up a page to stage in Missouri as part of her thespian festival and she got selected for that so I think it's and that's a huge and, boost in confidence for yeah, them. And, and really, I mean, where are the new plays in the United States coming out of? Active yep. Theater of Louisville. Yeah. And it's a pretty amazing program that you're lucky enough to be close enough. Yes, <laughs> like close I, enough. I am, I will say, I am. So. And, uh, one of our Columbus actors just is on the, the um, rep company there now, just just went up there recently to join them, so maybe she'll be in your students' play. Very cool. Um, yeah, there's Actors Theater. Also, our Shakespeare company, our Kentucky Shakespeare, underwent a lot of changes this year, and they went from putting on just two uh, shows a year to now they're doing an entire repertory thing, and their season goes from, like, April to, well, they just wrapped up last weekend. Um, and they do all kinds of different things from staged readings and everything, and they and they probably had, I think, 12 or 15 plays on their docket this year in various incarnations. So, yeah, Louisville's doing some pretty cool things. I'm happy. <laughs> and how far is Louisville from Eminence? Um, Louisville is about 45 minutes from Eminence. Um, so it's not, I mean, it's, a, you know, it's not bad. No, that's very doable. Yeah. <laughs> about four hours for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just made that trip to St. Louis a couple weeks ago. I remember that that road. <laughs> it's not so bad. No, it's pretty. It's pretty plain, but it gets you from here to there. Um, <laughs> uh, we usually ask our guests if there's any tech tips they have. I know <laughs> <laughs> may or may not. Well, pop. Well, during performances, there's not. But there's in yeah. your preparation, I don't know if you use anything with your students or not. And um, that's okay too. We rely heavily on Google Drive and Google Docs, actually. So hey, we're in Google right now. Um, because well, especially since I have kids that are not uh, that don't go to Eminence, I have to have ways to keep in touch, and it allows me to put documents online about you know costuming and garb and here's the joust schedule, and here's some new jokes and new puns we came up with, and I'll have Google Docs so they can add in, and so it becomes very collaborative. Um, but you're right, when we're actually at the fair site, you know, we have no lighting, we have, we don't even have shelter from the rain, though <laughs> I'm, I'm working on the boss to try to maybe get me a better stage next year, so I'm crossing my fingers. That's, that's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I want to Thank you uh, for taking time to join us, and I appreciate Donnie uh, connecting us together and that we're able, we had a little bit of <laughs> trying to get our uh, schedules figured out between uh, doing shows and uh, Renaissance fairs <laughs> and uh, all yes. that type of stuff. Um, if people wanted to uh, get in contact with you or find out what uh, you're doing in the about the the all the different things that uh, that are happening in Kentucky. Can you uh, tell us some ways that they might be able to do that? Yeah. Um, if you want to know more about the Renaissance Fair, um, the website is ky ren fair, and that's r e n f a i r e uh, dot com. And um, so, and especially for audition in information, that usually comes up after the first of the year. If people are interested there, and that'll also have our Dickens information there. Um, if you want to check out the Teen Guild and what they do, um, check on Facebook for Minions of Mischief. It should be the first one that pops up. Um, and if you want to email me personally, um, my email is uh, witsend. It's W-H-I-T-S underscore E-N-D at live.com. Great. And we'll be sure to share that information on the um, show notes. Great. <laughs> And Danielle, if people want to find you on the interwebs, what's some ways they can do that? Uh, you can find me on the Twitter or the Instagram at Ms. Phyllis, M-S-F-I-L-A-S, or you can go to my somewhat neglected blog, <laughs> edunerd.blogspot.com. And what about you, Nick? What if the people need to stalk you? <laughs> If they want to find me on the internet, they can, of course, Google me, and I think uh, I'm the first thing that uh, pops up because I've knocked the other people out. Because I have, too. You've gone down, other Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you can find me on Twitter at EdTech, the number four theater, spelled the correct way. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and also at EdTech, the number four theater.com. This is my blog. And um, you can find me on Google Plus also at Nick Cusimano. And so those are some ways to find us. I want to say thank you again to Whitney for joining us. Uh, it's been a great chat with you. And uh, just I uh, want to tell you how, uh, how much I admire the work you do with your students because I want to be a student in your class. Me I, too. <laughs> well, come visit. Come I want to be a minion. <laughs> oh, you, you guys should come visit. The, the Ren Fair is in June. you got plenty of time to plan your trip. And I'm not far from you. So. There you go. Well, thank you guys both for hosting me. I appreciate it. It was fun. And thank you once again, Donnie, for uh, making this uh, theater match work. Yes. <laughs> oh, Donnie, you big Cupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a Cupid with a backpack on, tied in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, want to be sure to tell uh, all our listeners to uh, check out the other shows on edreach.us and uh, be sure to um, catch us next week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>